and we have to really escalate the noise we make so that we'll be heard. Welcome to Gay USA. I'm Andy Hum. I'm Ann Northrup. And we come to you uh, today in a state of great confusion uh, <laughs> over the marriage cases. And of course, as Archbishop Chaput of Philadelphia says, confusion is of the devil. Anyway. Well, we'll see where that ends up. There, it is all confused. Uh, and there's breaking news every minute. Uh, decisions in South Carolina and Missouri this week. Uh, new cases filed in Nebraska and... Uh, Argued uh, in Mississippi. And, and, and Kansas and Idaho is rebelling. But the really big news is... The setback for marriage equality, which you probably have read of. Uh, the Sixth Circuit uh, Court uh, of Appeals... Uh, upheld state bans on same-sex marriage. That means Tennessee, Michigan, Ohio, and Kentucky. So the question is whether the Supreme Court is going to uh, take the appeals. And whether that will be good news for us or bad news. Uh, but uh, state and federal courts did make decisions this week in our favor in Missouri and South Carolina, but there's a lot more going on. And the Supreme Court's involved uh, over the stay issue in the Kansas case, but we're going to sort all this out uh, with the, uh, the premier gay legal legal in the United States, Professor Arthur Leonard of New York Law School. Are you the premier legal legal? I think legal? so. I don't know. I, th I think... <laughs> Think of a lot of premier legal eagles, but I keep an eye on things. Uh, you certainly do, and you've helped us out a lot. And we're going to turn to you again in just a minute. We also want to let you know we're going to talk about the Mennonite pastor who lost his uh, pastoring credentials because he presided over the wedding of his gay son. Uh, the Human Rights Campaign's Municipal Equality Index is just out, and the city that scored the highest may surprise you. It'll surprise me because you refuse to tell me what it is. Uh, there was a big win for transgender rights in Malaysia. And a legal same gender marriage took place in Russia. We'll tell you how. It's confusing the Russians a lot. Well, it's upsetting. Uh, all right. All right. But confusing and upsetting is the phrase of the week for the marriage cases now. Uh, it was now a week ago, but the Sixth Circuit bucked the trend of the other circuits, the Fourth, the uh, Seventh, the Ninth, and Tenth, uh, which had all legalized same-sex marriage. We have a map marriage. of these circuits there if you want to take a look at it. But the Sixth came out with a long-awaited decision. They took their time on this, and it was a two-to-one decision, and they said, oh, it's fine if these states ban same-sex marriage. And the decision, I would uh, suggest, was a, a ridiculous decision. And the uh, judge who dissented uh, said, if I didn't know any better, I think that the judge who wrote the majority opinion is trying to set this up for a Supreme Court uh, appeal so that marriage can be legalized nationwide. And I'll just throw in that they waited till after the election, pretty, pretty obviously, to issue the decision because well, they've been sitting on it for a long time. But well, let's, let's ask yeah, let's, our yes, legal, exactly. legal. You know, there, there are all kinds of conspiracy theories you can follow on this. Yeah. They, they heard argument uh, in the first week in August. And then uh, the Supreme Court denied review in the other cases in the first week in October. Right. And I suspect that uh, they were influenced by uh, that dis the Supreme Court's decision not to grant review. Then the Ninth Circuit came out the next day with their rulings on Nevada and Idaho. And I think they were also, uh, they were also affected by the Seventh Circuit's decision, which came out in the beginning of September. Uh, so... You know, from the time they heard argument, new things kept happening, things that they felt that they had to react to or respond to in some way. Uh, the Seventh Circuit decision was heavily quoted in the dissenting opinion, for example. Right. Uh, and when you have a dissent, it takes longer for a case to come out because the judge who writes the majority opinion has to submit it to the other judges on the panel, and if someone wants to dissent, 
you know, they're responding back and forth. Uh, they're talking about the dissent said this and the majority said that. So it takes longer. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't put a lot of weight on the fact that it took three months, which is actually rather speedy. I for was most just going to say we've gotten spoiled. So you know, three we, months really isn't a long we, time. We've had, we've had situations where you have oral argument of the circuit and it takes a year and a half to get an opinion out. Yeah. So this is pretty fast. So what do you think of this? Is it as stupid a decision as uh, it reads to me? or uh, it's, it's not a stupid decision if you understand the judge who wrote it and the judicial philosophy that he comes from. Uh, this is a judge who's deeply conservative. He clerked for Justice Scalia on the Supreme Court. Uh, Oy vey. He uh, was appointed by George W. Bush in his first group of appointees, mm -hmm. beginning of his administration, when the Democrats briefly had a majority in the Senate and the Democrats wouldn't even vote on him. They wouldn't bring him up. He had a reputation as being so deeply conservative. Uh, so Bush waited until the new Senate was elected, until he got a majority, and then he renominated him. So this judge said things like uh, the heroes of this uh, marriage movement should not be uh, judges. They should be the democratic process. And he yes. also goes all the way back and cites the Baker decision, which yeah. is, uh, uh, you know, a 1972 case of some guys from Minnesota who tried to get married, right. and the Supreme Court didn't uh, just said there well, was no federal issue in it. Well, what, what, what you have to understand about that, uh, and there is some dispute among federal judges about the precedential effect of cases like that. Uh, the uh, Minnesota case arose at a time when federal statutes required the Supreme Court to issue a decision on the merits of any case that came to them where a state law was ch constitutionally was, was being challenged. And so the, uh, the same-sex couple in Minnesota claimed that the ban on same-sex marriage there was unconstitutional. The Minnesota Supreme Court said no. They petitioned the Supreme Court for review. The court couldn't just deny the petition. They had to issue a decision. And what the court used to do in those days, because they got hundreds of these from around the country every year, uh, if they thought that it wasn't a serious enough case to give real attention to, they would just issue a one-line decision saying that the decision below is affirmed because it doesn't raise a substantial federal question. And so they used that. That's just a formula. You see it on hundreds of Supreme Court opinions from that time. But it is a ruling on the merits of the case. And so it is technically binding on lower federal courts. But the Supreme Court has explained that if developments in the law have superseded it, if, if later cases now make clear that there is a substantial federal question, then it's no longer binding. Well, wasn't there so this a, is the dispute that's yeah, going on. I mean, wasn't there a decision called uh, the Windsor decision that yeah. uh, sort of uh, the went Windsor into decision, these issues? <laughs> well, the, the Windsor decision uh, did not involve a 14th Amendment challenge for the right to marry. The Windsor decision was based on the Fifth Amendment, and it was whether Congress could discriminate between same-sex and different-sex marriages that were allowed by states. It's, right. a, it's a different question. And in fact, the First Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, which decided the other DOMA case at the same time as the Windsor case, you remember the Gill yeah. case? So this is up in New England. Yeah. Up in New England. First Circuit is in Boston. So the First Circuit, in their DOMA case, they said, we're still bound by Baker versus Nelson, that old Minnesota case. But luckily, this is a Fifth Amendment case, and the question is different. And so we can go ahead and decide the case and strike down DOMA. Well, and this has had repercussions within the past few weeks because we lost a marriage equality case in Puerto Rico. Yes. And the federal district judge in Puerto Rico said, I'm in the First Circuit. The First Circuit said in that DOMA case that Baker is still a binding precedent, so I've got to follow it. Now, I think he was wrong because Windsor came after Baker, and I think there are strong arguments to say that Windsor... Uh, certainly creates uh, an opening to consider the 14th Amendment questions. Well, but it, isn't, it didn't directly overrule Baker. It didn't even mention Baker. Uh, well, uh, there is a certainly argument about whether uh, Baker has been overruled. Uh, I think it's you been know. superseded. Uh, yeah. the, the, the argument is on these summary affirmances with these one line substantial, you yeah. know. The point is there are so many doctrinal developments in Supreme Court cases since then that cast that in doubt. I mean, that, that was decided at a time when the Supreme Court hadn't even begun to give serious uh, attention to the question of sex discrimination under the 14th Amendment, much less sexual orientation. Right. I just want to check in with the audience. Are, yeah. are you following all this? Okay, <laughs> well, because 
Yeah. Let, I, I, let's go back to the, the Sixth point Circuit. Is judge Sutton, he says right at the outset, he he's, says, the, he's the judge he's in the, the judge Sixth Circuit who ruled the against us. He says, I am bound by Baker versus Nelson. Okay. I am a humble, modest circuit court judge who can't overrule a Supreme Court decision. All right. The big, the big question yeah. that a lot of people have, yeah. I mean, if you've read the stories about yeah. this decision, is that people are saying this will force the hand of the United States Supreme Court. Now there's a difference in the circuits, and they have to resolve them. What's your opinion about that, uh, Professor? They don't have to do anything. <laughs> this is the thing about the Supreme Court. They right. have total control over right. their docket. They decide which cases they hear. Now, Justice Ginsburg, in a speech at the University of Minnesota Law School back in September, said, we see no great rush to take on the issue of same-sex marriage because the circuits are all deciding things the same way. She says, if a split develops, then perhaps we'll see the necessity to take the thing up. It'll become more urgent. And just and she pointed yeah. out, and the, uh, the Sixth Circuit may provide that uh, right. case because of the time we were all anticipating. And Justice Breyer said this week uh, that the status quo there, speaking of the Sixth Circuit ruling, uh, changes. So there are plenty of opportunities. It's kind right. of a cryptic quote. Well, and Justice Kagan was sitting right next to him and said, I'm not talking about this. Yeah. Well, the point is, when he, meant, when he said plenty of opportunities, we have a lot of circuits we haven't heard from yet. Right? So we got the six, which we, which we just heard from, but we hadn't just a week ago. Uh, we have appeals pending now in the Fifth Circuit and in the Eleventh Circuit, and we're about to get an appeal in the Eighth Circuit from that Missouri case. The Attorney General of Missouri said he's going to appeal, even though he agrees with the decision. He thinks we need an appellate ruling. Eleventh uh, so, is yet to be uh, uh, heard. Yeah, from. the eleventh and the fifth, the, the two southern circuits. Yeah. There's uh, the, the 11th, map there, folks. You'll see where all these circuits the 11th, are. The eleventh, we right. have the Florida so, case, and the fifth, we have Texas and Louisiana cases. Ninth, we thought was done, but Idaho is still fighting. Tenth is done. Eighth, it's just beginning to bubble up. Fifth, uh, it's bubbling up. Eleventh, it's bubbling up. Seventh is done. Sixth went against us. Fourth should be done, but South Carolina, even with a positive decision, yeah, they're still going to appeal. They're going to appeal. Uh, and first, second, and third never went to the Supreme Court because all those states legalized marriage. But, but Puerto Rico, right. in the First Circuit, is now going to throw a monkey wrench in that. Yeah, so we're going to have an appeal in the First now, Circuit. Now, it seems to me that uh, as we go around to all these states and, and cases, and circuits and every uh, judges are sort of cherry picking their opinions like they'll some of the conservative judges will look at DOMA and say well DOMA says that the states get to decide but uh, uh, circuits that agree with us say well DOMA said that the states get to decide but they don't get to discriminate so yeah. well, this, that's this the is more this is where thing. Justice and, Scalia is our friend and Baker right? uh, is still a question. Because, because, say because that again the, just, this is where Scalia Justice Scalia is our, is our friend because Justice Scalia has given the lower courts the roadmap <clears throat> on how to write the decisions for us yes in his dissenting opinion in Windsor he said the majority's reasoning leads to same-sex marriage and let me show you how and he took a big bunch of print right out of the opinion and he put it into his dissent and he changed a few words and he said this is what a same-sex marriage opinion will look like from a court on a, a challenge to a state law. So he gave them their marching orders and he's frequently referred to, his dissenting opinions are frequently referred to by the judges including in South Carolina uh, the opinion that came out this morning. Well, he predicted all this in the Lawrence case. Right. His dissent in Lawrence said as much. Yeah. So, so He uh, said it would lead to, uh, legalizing yeah. sodomy would lead to same-sex marriage. Yes. Even though Justice Kennedy, who wrote that decision, said, this isn't about same-sex marriage. No, it's about criminal law. <laughs> so do you have any prediction on whether Kennedy will have the guts to legalize same-sex marriage nationally, as everyone expects his vote to be the... I, I think I think he will. I think if you look at the Windsor opinion, the point is that he has empathy for the position of gay people. Now, I know empathy became a dirty word when Justice Sotomayor was nominated, and the president said, and she has great empathy for the people who pair before her, and then the Republicans on the Senate Judiciary Committee said, we don't want empathy, we want strict construction. But well, if they wanted strict they were misinterpreting empathy. Empathy yeah. is the ability to identify with somebody, to put yourself in their shoes, to understand the perspective in the world like, that they have. And Kennedy, somewhere in his past, he developed this empathy for gay people. And he's very conservative otherwise. He's very conservative otherwise. But he had gay neighbors back, who he used yeah, to have over right. for barbecues in and, his backyard. And all the way back in the 1980s, when he was a judge on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, he had a challenge to the Navy's ban. And he suggested that it might be unconstitutional. 
but he didn't feel that in the particular case he could go there. But he suggested that given the way the law is going. So, so yes, it's hard, he to has believe, empathy. Yeah, it's hard to believe that the guy who wrote the Amendment 2 case in the Colorado yeah. uh, 1996 and then the, the and sodomy he's got decision and the Windsor decision just would, a year would go ago. against us on this. Yeah, Why did, would he want to screw well, up his record? Yeah. Well, you see, just a year ago, just a year ago, the number of states that had same-sex marriage was pathetically small. You know, it was less than well, a dozen. Less than was, a dozen. It was pretty great compared, pretty great to, what compared to what it was ten years ago. Before. But <laughs> the point is, when, when Windsor came up, there were a handful of states that had same-sex marriage. But now we're verging on 35. Yeah. You know, and, and two-thirds of the country. Yeah. And so I think we're at a point, and the public opinion polls have headed up over 50% support. And uh, people under 30, it's like over 80% support. So the wind is blowing and the Supreme Court knows the direction the wind is blowing. All right, but you said the Supreme Court can do anything, and yes, that's true. And as Ann pointed out, they don't even have to take this Sixth Circuit right. case. But w what is your sense? I think that they will take the Sixth Circuit case. And the question is, will they take it early enough in the term that it can be argued this year, or will it, they take it later so it doesn't get argued till next fall? Well, that's, that's and that's a very deliberate strategic decision by the lawyers on our side who decided not to go for an appeal for to the full Sixth Circuit. Yeah, and, and going to the Sixth Circuit, there are 15 active judges on the Sixth Circuit. Ten of them were appointed by Republican Oh, presidents. I know. They're terrible. I so, looked them over. They're terrible. Yeah, so, so the point is, that's a waste of time to go for on back okay. in the Sixth Circuit. But we've gotten, we've gotten some yeah. good decisions from judges pointed, appointed by Republicans. Yes, we have. We have. And uh, what about all these little things like uh, uh, Governor Otter in Idaho trying to go back and undo what's been done, or, or well, Missouri, or what, South Carolina, what, what or Otter, any of these guys? What Otter is saying is that was a three-judge panel in the Ninth Circuit. Nobody yet has asked them to go on bank. Nobody has asked for a, a larger panel to decide it. Uh, it was a pretty liberal panel, three liberal judges who decided this case. Well, the Arizona lawyers claiming the fix was in yeah, on the Well, that's uh, the Nevada judges. lawyers, yeah. actually. But, uh, you know, he's, he's saying we deserve at least, before we're forced to allow marriage over the views of the vast majority of our, our uh, voting public who passed this marriage amendment a few years ago, He's saying we should get it more definitively than from this three-judge panel. So he's going for on-bank, and if on-bank is turned down, he's going to file a cert petition. And on-bank, again, folks, means that judges. you go to 11 judges in the, in the circuit. circuit rather than just the three judges. Right. But, and what about the... Um, and it's the, a randomly composed And what panel. about the Kansas situation? Because yeah. that's the first time the Supreme Court has granted a stay uh, no, after, no. after after the Sixth Circuit, right? Well, after the Sixth Circuit. That's what I'm saying. But they so haven't which, which is why yet. it's... You know, I'm, well, what's granted. happened is uh, that a petition for a stay was denied by the Tenth Circuit in the Kansas case. Uh, and the district judge said, if you don't get a stay from either the Tenth Circuit or the Supreme Court by 5 p.m. on Tuesday, my decision goes into effect. So the uh, Tenth Circuit turned them down last Friday, and then they filed the petition with the Supreme Court on Monday, and Justice Sotomayor, who does the Tenth Circuit petitions, she said, I want to hear from the other side by 5 p.m. tomorrow, which is 5 p.m. Tuesday. Uh, and she says, and we're going to hold up on making a final decision on a state who we've heard from both sides. Now, can she she's make probably going to refer it to the court. She probably, that's what all of these say. have been referred to the court on the marriage cases so far. They haven't been done by single and judges. And so is there... Uh, It'll take a day or two. So it could be today, it could be tomorrow, and I'm watching it, this as a potential signal of where things are going. Because the petition uh, for the stay strongly argued that in light of the Sixth Circuit decision, it seems highly likely the Supreme Court will be taking up this case. And if the Supreme Court is taking up this case, and it could go either way in the Supreme Court, why should Kansas have to allow marriage until that's all right. decided? All right, and let's, and let's go back a little bit, because, all right, they, they, if they take the Sixth Circuit case, they're going to decide it. Does that mean that, and they haven't taken all these other cases where they've allowed marriage to go into effect, right. but a lot of these states would like to ban same-sex marriage, even though right now people can get married there. Can they go back and say in their decision in the, if, if, with the Sixth Circuit, uh, yeah, states have the right to go ban same-sex marriage again? They could say that. They could affirm the Sixth Circuit. If, if they, and if that means votes. that states where it's already started can stop it? That means that states where it's already started uh, presumably could stop it. But that doesn't mean that it would necessarily invalidate the marriages that have taken place. That they usually don't do that. that they usually don't do that. They didn't do that people. in California uh, uh, in the Prop yeah. 8 case. A couple of other questions. Uh, again, taking a step back, uh, when they did deny review in the circuits that had legalized same-sex marriage, right. 
I, what was your read on that? Because, you know, was it uh, the four conservative judges thought they couldn't get a fifth vote and therefore don't uh, vote to take the cases? Or the liberal judges didn't think they could get a fifth vote and, and therefore don't take the cases? No, I read it, well, one way to read it is Kennedy wasn't ready to commit himself yet. And so neither side, you know, he's the man in the middle and there's four to his left and four to his right. And the four to his left don't want to grant cert unless they think they're going to win. And the four to his right don't want to grant cert unless they think he... And nobody knows how Kennedy's going to come out. So, uh, you know, there's no percentage on either side to grant cert unless there's a circuit split and we feel we really have to. And, and I think this was reflected in Ginsburg's speech in, in Minnesota when she said, you know, as long as they're all deciding it the same way, we feel no urgency. I think she was talking for herself and the people to the left of Kennedy. Uh, they don't see any urgency to grant a petition in, in a case as long as all the circuits were going the same way. But now that we've got a split, they will see the urgency, and I think those four would vote for it, even though they're not positive about how Kennedy's going to go. The liberals would the, vote the liberals to, because to they, take the case. You know, they look at his opinions in Windsor and Lawrence, and they show deep empathy for gay people and for the kids being raised by gay people. And, and I mean, he raised the issue in oral argument. He said, "What about the kids? How are they affected?" Yeah, and you know, it's still you know, a little bit of a crapshoot. For many yeah. years on the show, you know, we would always say things like, "Well, you know, this could be accepted in New York and California and things like that." What's going to happen when an Alabama or Mississippi is forced right. to? But even in states that are fairly conservative, it's not causing that much of an uproar other than the right wing trying to now come up with all these religious freedom right. arguments and why they shouldn't be associated with it. I mean, it. we haven't heard about riots in the street in Utah. Right. And that was the first state. Well, they're very, they're very genteel there, they're very yeah. civilized. Uh, but I don't think the, uh, you know, I don't think the uh, Church of Latter-day Saints is, is about to perform same-sex marriage. What do you well, mean? It was they, founded by a guy who had 40 mm, wives and one of them women. was 14. <laughs> They don't have to perform marriages, right. and, and let's not right. put out any sense that right. we think churches or synagogues no, or no, anyone is going to have to. No one will be, will be required to, but they can if they want to. And, and, and there is There this, are certain religious bodies that would be happy to do it, uh, including... And, and already have. I mean, look at North Carolina. You know, the yeah. decision that, that uh, declared the uh, ban illegal in North Carolina was brought by a bunch of churches. Yes. Those were the plaintiffs. Yes, exactly. And many churches do perform these marriages now. But I do want to ask, sort of in a historical context, uh, looking back to Brown v. Board of Education, that was a struggle to get that implemented right. and uh, took a long time and there was a great deal of resistance. And I wonder whether there's anything well, we should look at. Well, this, this is the interesting thing because we've gotten these marriage equality decisions in states with governors who were outspoken and adamantly opposed to same-sex marriage. Right. But when the, the, when the thing came down and it was clear that it was final, they said, we believe in the rule of law, we will comply. We haven't had anyone staging civil disobedience. Yeah, Mitt Romney had to do that in uh, in Massachusetts, and the right wing held it against him. They, yeah. they said you could have done more to stop it in Massachusetts back in 2003. He certainly tried I, a lot. I, now, I Butch talked, Otter is fighting to the last breath. Yeah. But, yeah. You know, uh, the, when the and final I'm, thing and comes Nikki out. And Nikki Haley will, too. Yeah. When Governor Phil Bryant was in New York, uh, the Mississippi governor, who has an out gay son, uh, who he doesn't talk about much, uh, you know, is obviously an opponent of same-sex marriage. And I said, well, what are you going to do when they order you to do do this. And instead of saying, we will do everything we can to stop this, and in this case, he says, well, we'll cross that bridge when we'll come to it. So okay. there's a, there is a sense of inevitability uh, that I think a lot of people are developing and about this. And I think they, there are a lot of leaders in the Republican Party are at the point now where they're saying, this is no longer a wedge issue that works for us, because the public has turned. Oh, and I think, because they do have gay kids. Yeah, and a I lot think, of them do. I <laughs> think the leaders of the Republican Party will be thrilled if this is over by 2016 for the right. election, and it can't be used as a thing to argue over. But there is still a substantial right wing in this country, oh, yeah. and they're uh, either because they want to raise money off it or because they are true believers or whatever, uh, the gray area is still up for grabs, and that is this uh, religious freedom uh, stuff that's going on yeah. about uh, public accommodations, uh, etc. And there was there was a second decision that was issued by the judge in Missouri. You know, the judge in Missouri issued one decision, uh, the district federal district judge striking down the marriage ban, and that's being appealed to the Eighth Circuit. But he also 
issued a separate ruling denying a petition by the Westboro Baptist Church to intervene. <laughs> yes. Because they said the state wasn't doing enough to defend it because, after all, the Attorney General, Chris Coster, is actually pro same sex marriage. Well, so, he, they also said yeah. that, you know, uh, this will be the destruction of the country oh, uh, by God and his wrath if this is allowed to go through. I mean, the court the West, didn't want to adjudicate that. I mean, that. Right. the Westboro Baptist Church was protesting Joel Osteen for, for <laughs> being, uh, you know, uh, silent uh, against the homosexual threat. Yes. But uh, they're going to appeal that, by the way, uh, the denial of the petition for them to intervene. Well, where do you see uh, Legal Legal, these attempts to you know, Texas, uh, someone's just introduced another one of these uh, religious freedom laws. Uh, are they going to gain any ground? Are they going to uh, win any of these? Well, there, there, is, a, there is a certain irony uh, to states that are introducing these laws when the states don't ban discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation right. anyway. Yes. Although in some of those states, there are cities that do, and this would yes. override the municipal laws. So yes. they're, like in Arizona, there was, you know, there's a state uh, statute that passed, but the governor vetoed it yes. after much lobbying by the business community, among others. Uh, and it wouldn't have affected the ability of people, many people around the state, uh, to bring a discrimination claim if, if uh, they were denied services because there was no ban on discrimination. But in a few cities, in Tucson, for example, in Flagstaff, there are bans. So it was significant. And I think we're going to see more of those proposals. Are we done with marriage? Uh, I think maybe we are. Well, I, I, would, I would like to hear about this late-breaking case that you, you were telling us about when you came in today, about yeah. a couple, a lesbian couple in upstate New York. Yeah, this was in Monroe County. This was reported in the New York Law Journal this morning. A uh, lesbian couple who got married in Vermont, I believe, in 2010, and they live in Monroe County, and their relationship was sort of on and off. Uh, and during an off period in their relationship, one of them had an affair with a man and got pregnant. Uh, but the affair ended, and she gave birth to the child, and of course she's married at the time, so the assumption is that her spouse is also the legal parent of the child. At least the traditional assumption under law is that when a married woman gives birth to a child, the child is the legal child of her husband. Well, should that apply to a wife? And what if the guy who got her pregnant now wants to be declared the father? And so there's this litigation going on up there where the guy is demanding a court order uh, declaring that he is the father and he wants genetic testing done and uh, the women are opposing that and the, sort of the kicker is the women are planning to get divorced but both of them do have maternal bond to the child and uh, they believe that they are the, the parents of this child. And so uh, the judge said, well, you know, it's sort of odd to presume that the wife of the pregnant woman is the father of the child because how can a wife be a father? And how can you have two mothers of a child? Well, you can have two mothers of a child because we have marriage equality in New York, that's why. And most of the time these issues come up without the interference of a man because you have anonymous sperm donations. But when you have a known sperm donor, there's always a danger that uh, someone who wants to assert their rights is going to try to uh, push their way in. But even if you had a heterosexual married couple and the wife had an affair uh, and became pregnant by another man, uh, that man could certainly uh, uh, petition for some kind of... Depends uh, what state you're in. Uh, many states absolutely forbid any kind of interference, anything that would suggest that the child is not legitimate. Uh, California he, he has a complete He can't petition for a DNA test. He can't assert. Uh, it depends. Depends where you are. Depends where you are. And and I'm not sure how a New York court would would deal with that. But there are some cases that are mentioned in this opinion, which I just read very briefly before coming up here uh, to film with you, uh, that suggested that uh, it wouldn't be allowed in New York. But can't you separate uh, the biology from the discussion then of parental rights? Can't you uh, acknowledge a married couple as being the legal parents uh, and, and uphold their parental rights well, while still acknowledging the biology of well, who the genetic well, parents well, are? Well, I think he's, he's pushing to be a legal parent, I think. But that's a, that's a separate conversation. Yeah, and here's the problem. We don't yet have a, a firm ruling in New York that a child can simultaneously have three legal parents. We have that in California now, Absolutely. but not in New York. I, I, I remain uh, 
uh, heart sick that children don't have a right to know their genetic heritage. I, I think that has got to trump well, any of these parental no rights. No one is, I mean, the, the mother, the birth mother is not denying that this man is the biological father of the child. She's not denying it at she's all. She's not saying it this was an immaculate conception. Right. This, this, uh, she's not going to claim it's donor insemination because it wasn't. Uh, that it was anonymous sperm or something. Then why so would this you need DNA know. tests? Yeah, in other words, you don't. Uh, that, yeah. But, but uh, this fellow is insisting that he wants proof that he can document it so then he can go forward and he can assert parental rights. <laughs> so and I used immaculate conception wrong, but um, we'll talk more about that later. I didn't yeah. hear that. All That's right, mixed well, in some of the fishes and moves, right? I, I, I think we've confused our viewers enough. Okay. Uh, but we'll see. Uh, there will probably be ten more developments before the show even airs. That's possible. And if and if you get them, send them to me, and I'll put them in our uh, 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 email that goes out this evening, uh, and we'll explain. Or you can scroll them under the screen. <laughs> But if I probably, only. I probably won't get back to the law school before you're done. Oh, okay. okay. Thanks for being with thank us, Art. Thank you, Art. Sure. Uh, it's a pleasure, always. Sorry really to appreciate. throw you into this maelstrom, but thank you for helping us sort it out. All right. All right. So, uh, and in other footnotes to marriage news this week, uh, there is the case of the uh, Mennonite pastor, uh, <laughs> Charles Wenger, 96 years old, in Pennsylvania. He... Uh, officiated at the uh, same-sex marriage of his son, his son in his 50s, who'd been kicked out of the church, what, 30 years? 35 years, years ago <laughs> for being gay. So there, just, there, there's the whole happy family. Yeah. But this guy says, I did it for the love of my son and the love of my church, and he still loves the church that really doesn't treat his son very nicely. And he's lost his uh, credentials as a pastor. Well, I'm glad he's pressing the issue and maybe he can shake things up and sow some confusion over there among the Mennonites. Well, uh, speaking of confusion, there's still confusion in the Social Security Administration. <laughs> you know, there's this whole thing. Uh, once DOMA, the DOMA decision happened in the Edie Windsor case, and legally married same-sex couples were given federal benefits. That section of DOMA was overturned. So then the federal government tries to twist itself into knots about how they're going to uh, open up the floodgates of federal benefits to these legally married couples. But in some cases, any if you're legally married anywhere, you get these benefits yep. anywhere. But in other cases, they claim there were regulations that said, uh, you know, you can only get uh, these benefits if you live in a state that acknowledges your marriage, even if you were legally married wherever. Uh, so it, it became this whole thing. Well, it doesn't sound very fair. Yeah. Well, now the it's social a federal benefit, and it has taken them uh, over a year, year and a half now, to still be sorting this stuff out. The Social Security Administration is now demanding back pay. Uh, the, uh, they want to be paid back for overpayments they made to same-sex couples now that they've decided that some of them don't deserve the payments they got because they took a year to decide who was eligible and who wasn't. Outrageous. Their delay... Where's President Obama when you need him? Oh, my God. Isn't he still the president? Yeah. Can he clear this up? Uh, the law allows waiver of repayments, but they're still. Uh, but the Social Security Administration has decided to go after them after all. I want the president to grant them a pardon, <laughs> and and uh, the ability to hang on to the payments they got. Well, and it, my, uh, do you have other marriage news? Well, uh, there was a filing by the ACLU in the Nebraska case to challenge the state ban. That's in the Eighth Circuit, where Missouri is, where we won two cases this past week. And uh, that circuit also includes Arkansas, Iowa, Minnesota, where they already have same-sex marriage, and North and South Dakota, where they don't. Yeah. And finally, I want to ask you, you uh, actually watched this Two and a Half Men show where uh, John Cryer and Ashton Kutcher were getting married. So I had would be never off. watched Two and a Half Men in my life. <laughs> But I'm flipping channels, and of course our viewers have alerted to us that they have this uh, uh, same-sex marriage theme because yes. the boys are going to get married so that uh, Aston Kutcher's kid will have... Uh, oh, it makes it easier for him to adopt if he's got a spouse. Okay. So that's the whole premise. All I have to say is I didn't crack a smile during the whole thing. I just... I, just, I, I thought the jokes were completely uh, uh, limp. Uh, and uh, un uninventive, uh, um, you know, I, 
I don't get it. I don't get why it's so successful, but there's hope for all of us, all of us writers out there, that we could write crap like that. Well, I, I did get one note that, because uh, I was concerned that, that it would be an excuse to turn it all into homophobic jokes about, ah, mm. oh, we're not really blah, blah, blah. But I understand they have now contrived a lesbian daughter of the late Charlie Sheen character, and she popped up to uh, say that she was annoyed that the men were exploiting all the work gay people yeah, had yeah. done yes, for years. Yes, 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 that's in there too. It's just not funny. Okay. All right. All right. Other news. Well, I have a correction from last week. I mentioned a forum that was going to be taking place on homeless uh, uh, LGBT youth for, for uh, next week. Uh, not only did I give the wrong date, but now it's not even happening. <laughs> Does anybody care? <laughs> we all care. All right. But there's another forum taking place that night that I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, in other news, terrible case out of Greensboro, North Carolina. Stephen White, 46 mm. years old, uh, um, you know, well-known local gay resident, went to his local bar where he was a regular, good guy, had served in Iraq, had been wounded, uh, was, uh, you know, uh, just a stand-up guy in the community. So he uh, ends up uh, leaving the bar with a guy named Gary Gupton, uh, 26 years old, and they go to a hotel and the net result is that Stephen White is uh, beaten up, robbed, and set on fire. 50% uh, of his body is, uh, is burned. Well, well, I don't know if uh, the anti-violence projects uh, for a safe time campaign would have helped them. Uh, but it is about st staying safe while hooking up. Uh, they're advertising on apps like Grindr, Rent Boy. Backpage, B, some of these I don't know, BGC and VGL. I assume that means very good looking, but uh, I, I, I haven't been there. <laughs> well, it's a conundrum because we tell people, uh, you know, identify the person you're going to end up with, tell your friends you're going to uh, go with them, uh, make yourself as safe as possible. And I'm sure that the vast majority of these situations, the vast majority of these situations do not end up in these kinds of attacks. But these attacks do happen regularly. And we're vulnerable. And criminals have realized that we're vulnerable, have sure. always realized that we're vulnerable sure. and taken advantage of that. Now, in the old days, we didn't even report crimes against us, but we do now. Mm -hmm. Uh, speaking of uh, gay bars, a somewhat more uh, trivial story, but Boots and Saddle, which is a 40-year-old gay bar in New York, uh, re it's referred to as a drag bar in the stories, uh, has finally found a place to relocate on. Uh, they lost their lease. They're moving to uh, south of Sheridan Square there to the old Actors Playhouse, which doesn't have anybody living above it. So the neighbors, because basically the village has become kind of uptight mm -hmm. about bars and all those kinds of things. Well, it's all real estate stuff, too. Yeah. Uh, in, oh, uh, postscript in election news, uh, out gay Republican Carl DeMeo lost his uh, bid for Congress out of San Diego. That race ended up in a lot of... Uh, ugliness. Very ugliness. There were a lot of uh, sexual harassment charges being dumped on, in the press uh, right before the election. But one of the guys who uh, charged him with yes. sexual harassment has been arrested for stealing documents from his office. It was a narrow loss, and this guy, Scott Peters, the Democrat incumbent, did win. In Idaho... Very pro-LGBT. In, uh, in Idaho, John McCrossity became the first out gay man elected to the state House of Representatives. He's a Democrat. He's a school teacher. There was an out lesbian, Nicole Lafavor, yeah. who served from 2009 to 12. She's um, a great activist. She's been leading the Add the Four Words campaign and in he's part of Idaho. That as, and he's part of that as well. For non-discrimination. In, in Colorado, a radical anti-gay activist was elected oh. to the House. Gordon, Dr. Chaps, Klingenschmidt. Uh, <laughs> He has a show where he claims gays want your soul and abuse our own children. You can he, see him all over YouTube. He's he also is attempted a mess. an exorcism on President Obama, and he will be representing the uh, good people of Colorado Springs. But do you know who the advocates person of the year is? No. Vladimir Putin. Well, because he had the most effect on gay issues, uh, the way Time Magazine yes. used to pick Hitler once yes. in a while. Yes, well, that's exactly. okay. That's probably true. Well. Uh, a bright spot in the elections. Yes. Uh, the, the Republican Party spent $14 million in several states to unseat liberal judges in Tennessee, North Carolina, Kansas, and Montana, and they failed in every 
case to do that. That's great. It's there a, was also a nice story in the New York Times this week about how in Colorado they had actually replaced some uh, conservative legislators with uh, more liberal ones, even though they threw out uh, Mark Udall yes. as the senator. It's a, it was still a miserable election, but you know, uh, th things are changing. The KKK chapter in Montana says it will no longer discriminate based on race, religion, or sexual orientation. Rebranding itself <laughs> as, wait a minute, what is what's left? Rebranding itself as Rocky Mountain Knights. That sounds nice. It's a fraternal order out to fight the new world order of one world government. But I don't uh, think you're going to get a lot of African American and gay members. At least I hope not. Oh, uh, and how do we feel about Cindy Lauper's True Colors Fund giving a lot of money to Covenant House International to help LGBT homeless youth? That's what this forum was supposed to be about. <laughs> I, uh, 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 I will say that Paul Schindler of the Gay City News is working on an in-depth story on this and Good. talking to all sides, Good. including True Colors, including Covenant House. Uh, and Covenant it's House does not have a great track record. Is, well, it's a Catholic organization. Yes. So they were always problematic in terms of affirming gay youth, mm -hmm. affirming trans youth, mm -hmm. not even allowing them to wear makeup, you know, that kind of stuff. And, uh, and uh, so bad on safe sex, bad on gay stuff, you know, so I don't know. We'll see. Uh, I, it's, I look know, forward to the it's story. It's the biggest, it's the biggest uh, operation in town. They have the and, most capacity. And internationally. This, is, this money is going to be used internationally because it turns out they have facilities in uh, several other countries and cities. What do we think about our new Attorney General nominee, uh, Loretta Lynch uh, from Brooklyn, African-American woman, would I be the first one. I am thrilled that she was the prosecutor on the Abner and Louima case and went which after is the, the Which is the cops. guy where a cop put a broomstick up Abner Louima's rectum and then she successfully prosecuted that case. She does seem to be pretty embedded with the Wall Street street crowd though and yeah. I'm concerned about that uh, well we'll see uh, but as long as we're on presidential stuff the announcement was made of the 2014 presidential medals of freedom winners and a couple of them are gay uh, the late Alvin Ailey and Stephen Sondheim are they a couple <laughs> <laughs> no uh, and it's all of course for most of our viewers they're more probably concerned that Meryl Streep's gonna get one too uh, the uh, Williams Institute at UCLA Law School has uh, released a number of new studies. One is that they have looked at, uh, they've aggregated 20 years of surveys worldwide to look at opinions of uh, LGBT people over that time span and around the world and have found a significant rise in respect for LGBT. LGBT people over and the last they have 20 found years. that greater inclusion of, of LGBT folks is associated with economic development. See, I don't buy that one. I think you could just as easily say that uh, countries that have good economic development are nicer to LGBT people. Which rather came than first, the chicken or the egg? Exactly my question. But I will. And what uh, good is economic development <laughs> if you lose your immortal soul and you sell out your God? I think Patrick Reed lost his immortal soul. This what is a, a golfing footnote. He's a prominent uh, U.S. golfer, and uh, you know they televise these was tournaments. He the, was, he the, was he the guy in the uh, in the uh, Ryder Cup? Yes. He, oh, yeah. He was the sort of the star the, of the Ryder Cup, wasn't he? Uh, he's the for brash, the United for the, the United States. He's the we lost the losing team. He's the brash young guy who won three tournaments last year and said, "I'm in the top five of players in the world." Oh. And then it turned out he wasn't. He's got a lot of confidence, except in this case. Yeah, well, then he uh, three putts a green in this tournament. Which is bad in golf. You and don't want to do that. You don't want to take any more than two. Yes, and uh, it's being broadcast live. And the uh, microphones pick up him saying to himself, nice effing three putt, you effing faggot. And he didn't say effing. But and he did say faggot. He, yes, and he, he spelled out the word I have abbreviated. And the announcers immediately said, uh, we're very sorry that the microphones picked up that uh, comment. And then he got uh, called out and fined by the PGA, and he well, had to apologize. What kind of an apology did we get? What excuse could he make for such vile... Language. I've said some bad things, uh, missing a putt. Uh, I don't think he made excuses. Putt. I think he said that he said the wrong thing and he was sorry. I learned as a as a caddy also. I heard some very creative cursing by these captains of industry I used to 
Daddy for. I won't repeat them well, on this family show. I hear a lot of homophobia in the golf do course. You? I do, what in do you? the form of uh, men who call themselves women for doing bad stuff. You would call that sexism? I would call it both because they're saying they're effeminate if they, uh, if they do something wrong. And I have a formula for this because it's very common for men to, you know, make a bad shot and say, oh, nice shot, Mary. Well, as a young gay activist, I was... Can I finish my thought? Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sure. <laughs> Please. Uh, so they'll... It's your honor. They'll call themselves women when they make a bad shot. And I will say to them, yes. isn't this fascinating? Here is a man who makes a bad shot and calls himself a woman as a, 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 a way of describing himself as a bad person. And yet, it was not a woman who made the bad shot. It was the man. Well, it's, look, it's like when I try to object to people saying something sucks, because what they mean is cocksucker, if I can say that word on the show. Probably you know, not. Oh, uh, well, all right, I'm just saying. But it, you hear the word an awful lot. Come on, listen to the Nixon tapes. It's all over it. Uh, that was a long time ago. <laughs> no, no, we're only getting some of them now. <laughs> Uh, but what I'm saying is people look at it as a put-down word, sucking. Sucking is putting down. And I'm saying... Yes, and men and calling I always, themselves and I, women And I always is, say, uh, you do not like to be sucked. I mean, you think it's a bad thing. Mm. I think you think it's a nice thing. Mm. But you think of the person who does it as in some sort of an inferior position because yeah. it's a woman or a gay. You know, so I think we ought to think about our language a lot more. And I, if we're still on the air after this is all over. <laughs> we may or may not be. Uh, well, and in nicer language, the Human Rights Campaign has a new ad campaign going in the southern states. Uh, uh, a TV ad featuring a mother of gay sons and how she came to uh, accept and uh, adore them. Uh, so they're reaching out. All right. So, and the Human Rights Campaign also has a Municipal Equality Index, and they rate people on all sorts of things. And the city with the highest score this year is, you have a guess? Cincinnati. No. Yes. Oh, so they said this to a political science professor there. He says, you're kidding me. He says to the it's reporter. It's just not Wait right. a minute. They're there in Cincinnati having a big ceremony today about it. Now, remember, Cincinnati, in 1993, the voters there banned gay rights. They yes. passed a referendum. Yes. They repealed it in 2004. They just started a domestic partner registry recently. Contractors there can't discriminate. And they added transgender procedures to their health benefits. That's something I don't think we have in New York. Uh, anyway, the mayor there is uh, John... Oh, I'm not gonna, I didn't write his name down clearly, so I'm not going to say it. Mayor John uh, is, uh, had a big press conference about it today. Okay. Um, nice to see that the UN Committee Against Torture expressed concern about gay conversion therapy in the United States of America <laughs> as torture. Yes. Okay. All right, international news. Uh, we were, uh, there's a terrible story out of Hungary. A 26 year old preeminent LGBT leader there, uh, Milan Rocha, uh, has died. He is believed to have taken his own life. 26 years old. Depressed. The Harvey Milk of Hungary. Well, he led the protests for LGBT rights there, but also was involved in many other issues, including fighting nuclear power and taxing uh, the, the internet. Uh, internet. Uh, he climbed over, uh, uh, climbed over a fence of the Russian embassy in February to protest Putin on, on gay issues. Now, his father had also killed himself after he led a pride parade. I don't know if there was any relationship there, but so some trouble there. And I, I, I will say... It's just a huge loss of someone is. who was a, a really important activist uh, in a really tough situation because it's really uh, violent and bad for yes. gay people in Hungary. And it's not so great in Malaysia because they've got anti-gay laws there, but the Court of Appeals there, and we have a picture of the rally, ruled that Sharia law against cross-dressing by transgender people was degrading, oppressive, and inhumane. They ruled the case had nothing to do with homosexuality, uh, which there are laws against. The Human Rights Watch says Malaysia is one of the worst countries for trans people. Uh, Anti-trans laws are in every state, uh, and, and some have been jailed up to three years for violating them. So this is a big breakthrough in Malaysia. Yeah. 
Uh, in Uganda, the, a committee of the ruling party is preparing a new anti-homosexuality bill, although you may remember the court uh, uh, got rid of the old one, uh, and the president has said he doesn't want a new one, but uh, this new one that is being written could be even worse than what's been overturned. Okay. At the Vatican, uh, uh, well, f first of all, Cardinal Bagnasco, who's the head of the Italian bishop, said same-sex marriage is a Trojan horse undermining the core of humanity. Those are, that's not very nice, Cardinal. <laughs> but then the Pope did further demote, further demote Cardinal Raymond Burke. We got a picture of uh, Cardinal Burke. Well, that's, you chose that picture on purpose. I did. <laughs> he's an arch conservative among conservatives. Uh, it sounds as if he's being fired for insubordination. Yeah. Uh, Burke had the high, highest judicial post in the Vatican. Now he's been given a job with what they say are no responsibilities. But here's a quote from this Cardinal. The Pope is not free to change the Church's teachings with regard to the immorality of homosexual <laughs> acts or the indissolubility of marriage. You got it, Francis? Well, here's the problem. Uh, most of the cardinals currently in office were appointed by the right-wing previous popes, Benedict right. and, uh, and his predecessor. When was there a liberal pope? John Paul XXIII. No, oh, well, everybody feels kindly towards him. It was the 60s, and a lot of these social issues were not being raised. Uh, but uh, you would agree that he was a more... He was very cuddly. <laughs> yes, he was. And this one, I don't know if I consider him cuddly. Anyway, uh, everything's in an uproar because he's at least one inch to the, uh, to the left of the, his predecessors, and so these cardinals appointed by his predecessors yes. are totally in a, a tizzy yes. because they don't know what to do. In all seriousness, John the 23rd is the one who started the Vatican Council that opened up the church, allowed people to say mass in the vernacular language of their land instead of Latin, things like that. But it didn't lead to women priests or anything. All right, now, where are we? In Russia. Our, yes. Two huh. women got married in St. Petersburg yep. in white wedding dresses. We, we got have a, picture a picture of them. Uh, it was allowed because one of them was born a male, and that's what their passports say. But v Vitaly uh, Milanov, who was the Ted Cruz of Russia, said that the staff at the office should be tried for treason. He's seeking to have the marriage annulled. Um, uh, the, the transsexual one is the one on the right. Well, Sa now we see Milanov. Oh, I'm sorry. There's Milanov. He's, well, who knows about him? He says... Uh, uh, she says she knows that when her documents are finalized, her marriage won't be recognized anymore, at least in Russia, but at least she'll be married. Well, uh, the fact is that because the, uh, the Russian uh, government will not recognize her as female, right. technically she is legally married. It's the only person uh, she can legally marry. Exactly. Uh, and yet they're in an uproar because it looks like a same-sex marriage. But not if Milanov has anything to do with it. He says these these mad people should be banned altogether from getting married. <laughs> Everybody deserves somebody, uh, Vitali. And I was disappointed to see that Elton John has been back performing in St. Yes. Petersburg. He, uh, you know, he criticizes the law openly. He criticizes the destruction of the iPhone statue that was taken down because Tim Cook is gay. Uh, he talks about, you know, what about Tchaikovsky? But there he is performing in uh, Russia. Yep. I, I think it would be nice if he refused one of those invitations. Well, I imagine next he'll be in Saudi Arabia where a man was sentenced to three no, years. No, next he'll be doing Rush Limbaugh's next wedding. <laughs> oh, oh, is he getting married again? No, I just made oh. that up. Saudi Arabia, a man was sentenced to three years for immoral acts for posting naked pictures of himself to have free sex with uh, men. Well, as opposed to paid, I suppose. Uh, also, he was also he fined by the Commission for the Promotion of Virtue and the Prevention of Vice. <laughs> That's what they have in Saudi Arabia. Uh, where uh, are we? Latvia, the foreign minister, has come out. He I proudly <laughs> announce I am gay. Good luck to all of you, he said on Twitter. <laughs> And he, uh, he wants uh, same-sex partnerships legalized. 
The uh, International Lesbian and Gay Association Conference just happened in Riga, Latvia, but Latvia may be about to do a uh, law like uh, there is in Russia for no promotion of homosexuality. Well, the Russian deputy prime minister said of uh, Edgar Rinkovics, who was the foreign minister who came out, if you have nothing else to be proud of, I guess you can be proud of that. <laughs> That's North not very nice. In Northern Ireland, a, so a so-called Christian bakery has been ordered to apologize and pay compensation for refusing to make a Bert and Ernie cake that, that said, said support same-sex marriage. Yeah. Now they said, they're going to fight this. Well, this is what God wants them to do. Yeah. Uh, but you called it a Christian bakery. It's a bakery. They happen to be exactly. Christian people. I said a so-called well, Christian I know. bakery. Uh, uh, by the way, Northern Ireland is the only part of the United Kingdom where you can't get married legally, same sex, and uh, the Republic of Ireland is having a referendum in the spring. And then there is France, which finally has an out gay envoy uh, ambassador, and it happens to be to the United States. And there he is, uh, Gérard Arrault. Uh, he is uh, our um, uh, French ambassador to our country. Very, very popular. Samantha Power says he's one of the most authentic and authentically decent people ever to practice diplomacy. Excellent. All right, AIDS news in our uh, last couple of minutes. Uh, a, a settlement reached by an insurance company, Cigna, with uh, Health and Human Services and activists in Florida. Uh, insurance companies have this uh, little scheme where they classify HIV drugs on the most expensive tier. And then they say, well, you may get a prescription from your doctor, but we have to approve it first. And even if it's a generic, we're going to put it in the expensive tier and you're going to have to spend like two thousand dollars a month to get this stuff and activists uh, filed a complaint on this as discrimination against people with a certain condition and a settlement has been reached and they're going to knock all this down but this takes place all over the country and this is just the first step in stopping these insurance companies from discriminating it's a terrible story right also in AIDS, it's a sign of changing times. In 1995, they opened up something called Rivington House, uh, which is for homeless people with AIDS, and they're closing it because, basically because of the drugs, they don't have too many customers. Yeah. So clients are being shift, shipped uptown. But there are a lot of long-term survivors around, and, uh, and soon 50% uh, of the people living with HIV will be over the age of 50. And Tuesday, the 18th, next week, from 6.30 to 9 at the LGBT Community Center, there will be a town hall meeting for long-term survivors and older adults with HIV. Okay. Uh, quick entertainment notes. Very quick. Glamour Magazine is named Laverne Cox a Woman of the Year for her advocacy. Uh, also named was out lesbian Robin Roberts on that list. Uh, Life with Lisa Ling on CNN on Friday will look at gay cowboys and cowgirls Friday at 9 p.m. Eastern. And how about the amazing Randy? The um, I didn't know that he was gay. He's got an immigrant you partner with a lot of attention. trouble. I, well, I He's been out for a long I'm time. I'm the host, co-host of the Gay USA show. And yet. All right. Well, thank you very much. It's been a confusing uh, week, but we'll be back with more explanations of whatever's going on next week. With the amazing Randy. No. No. Bye. Pro probably not. You never know. Thank you. Bye.